Hello everyone, I am Patrick Holden and uh, with my wife Becky we make Havod's cheese. Uh, it's an honour to be the first speaker, producer at this British Cheese Weekender and I'm here with Jen Cast, who is formerly of Neil's Yard Dairy yep. uh, but now one of our two cheese makers and we are going to be discussing the relationship between land, place, this farm, and food, and of course, the food we produce, cheese. So Jen, um, how should we frame this discussion? Well, so I was thinking it might be nice if we first just started out with the sort of understanding of the land in which you are located and why you chose to be here, because you did choose it. We did, we chose it in 1973. Uh, I'd come from grown up in London and we wanted to get back to the land to form a community farm and West Wales seemed a dreamy wild place mm. uh, with uh, nature still in the ascendant and when I remember coming here the excitement I felt that this was a sort of pristine place where the relationship between the land and the wider environment was still largely intact nature spirits in the hedgerows that sort of thing and uh, I suppose what's always interested me since I was a child actually was ecosystems, mm -hmm. but managed ecosystems. So the human being involved with farming is not a passive element, it's a very active relationship you have with the land and the landscape. But in the case of farming and food production, the aim is to work in harmony with nature and, pro and produce a food which is a surplus without di diminishing the kind of the biodiversity and the atmosphere and the spirit of place. Can I interrupt? So, because often you have that position where people talk about the two separate things that you have land, you're, you have nature, and then you have agricultural land. But listening to you now, it seems that those two things, if you consider humans as part of that nature, then our agricultural land would sort of by default have to be part of that nature. Yeah, I think Rudolf Steiner first talked about that in his agriculture lectures back in the 1920s. He said the human being, the person, is not separate from the farming system. Of course, we are not separate from nature. Mm. We are part of nature. So our interrelationship with our farm ecosystem is part of the whole dynamic of food production. And it's interesting, just before we started filming, we saw a hare. <laughs> running across that field which has just been sown uh, with oats and peas which will feed the cows but there is the hare yeah. coexisting with us. And it felt like something out of like an African safari actually not to but just the way the legs moved and everything. It exactly. Was quite remarkable. Yeah so this question about the relationship between land, farming and food maybe I should say a little bit first about the farm. The farm is we're standing on the top of the hill, 783 feet. We're actually standing on the farm reservoir, which is spring water pumped from a spring right at the bottom of the hill, right up here, and then it gravity feeds the farm. But the water is from the rainfall. So that's a part of the system. We've captured the water, pristine, clear water, mm -hmm. which is delicious to drink. It's very Absolutely. soft. And so this uh, irrigates the farm. But we have a total of about 300 acres. Some of it is rented, more than half is rented actually, and then the, the rest is owned and we're on the top of the hill and the farm goes in all directions from here down the hill. So this, if we could move the camera around, would give you that 30, 360 degree view of your whole area. Yes, yeah. and we're in wild West Wales where it rains a lot and the climate can be quite challenging, wouldn't you say, Jen? <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Coming um, from Detroit and then London. Yes, I would definitely say. Yes, and also just to say about the farming system, uh, most of the land is in grass, but half of it is grass, which is part of a rotation, mm -hmm. a seven year rotation, five years of which is building soil fertility through clover and grass and herbs and other unsown stuff. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. And then the other two years is growing oats and peas, which we feed daily to the cows, mm. uh, the milking cows. And the permanent grass uh, is either grazed or cut for hay or cut for silage. And we can see that as well. And the reason why half the grass is permanent is because 
this hill, which is quite challenging environment to farm, you know, it's, you could say it's marginal. Um, the, the fields that we've got in permanent grass are not really flat enough or the soils are too challenging or thin or something uh, to plough and part, uh, make part of the rotation. So we are predominantly a grassland farm, but unlike our neighbours, and if you look around you can see that, not many of them are growing arable crops, but I think that could change. I just explained that we had a rotation which lasts seven years on the better land. This is a field called Elsinol. I won't go into the history behind it, it's quite amusing. And uh, this is, this field has been around the rotation at least five times since we've been here. We used to grow carrots in the field actually, but that was another chapter. But right now we're standing on a herbal lay, which was sown in the autumn of 2019. We don't normally uh, re-sow our pastures uh, in the autumn because it's challenging to get them established before the rain comes and the frost comes. So this is not, I would say, as good a lay as it would be if we were under sowing it. But basically what you see here, and we'll have a look at it in a moment, we'll have a close-up, mm -hmm. is a diverse mixture of rye grasses, fescues, I think there's some coxfoot in this one, and of course clovers both red and white, plus herbs which then provide uh, deep rooting uh, nutrients for the cows and then I think enhance the quality of the, um, the milk that they produce. And we've always used for many years now lays with uh, grass mixtures with herbs in them because we think that's nutritionally good but also good for soil building mm -hmm. which is important. And as an extra from a cheese making standpoint, it's also really nice for the sorts of flavors that you can get in the raw milk. So that's a, a benefit there as well. What we wanted to do right from the moment we came here was to farm in harmony with nature and minimize our use of chemical fertilizers and pesticide sprays, that kind of thing. Build soil fertility through cycles, which is of course the crop rotation I just mentioned. And hopefully build soil, because that's important too, and uh, coexist with nature so that we wanted the biodiversity of this place, both the agricultural biodiversity, because we chose a native breed, Ayrshire mm -hmm. cows, we can come back to that, and also the birds and the small mammals and the insects and all the wonderful wildlife which coexists with the farming system, not just around the edges, which is what's been the case with stewardship, but in the field as well. So maybe we should have a look at this field. So we've got lots of chicory, We've got clover here, and you should find some yarrow, although it's not springing to mind, the light here. There's some chick a chickweed, which is a quote weed. And then there are, of course, uh, there will be dandelions in this field as well. And we'll go in a moment to a permanent pasture and see the difference. So we are certified organic. In fact, I wrote what I think was probably the world's first draft of the organic dairy standards because they didn't exist. And I was a farmer on the, um, Soil Association Livestock Standards Committee at the time, so they said, well, you're a dairy farmer, you should write the standards. So what we tried to write was a prescription for sustainable farming. And now we've learned a lot, of course, we learn every day, but our system today has evolved from those early days. We're now the longest established organic dairy farm in Wales, but I, th I see our practice here is in a wider context because I'm not really interested in whether organic or regenerative or agroecological or sustainable or biodynamic, or I'm interested in all those things, but I'm more interested, even more interested, in the practices. Mm -hmm. Because the question is, what are the farming practices which build soil fertility, which minimize our emissions, which purify the water, which are, you know, all those things, and how can we have this relationship with this hill by in the least possible amount of external inputs, whether it's animal feeds or seeds or anything like that and at the same time produce a genuine surplus of wonderful nutrient dense cheese. So essentially you're working with that as a principle that what you've just explained and then it's almost like the other sort of labels kind of come around on the round on the outside yeah. and you just have your core of what your principles are and then you can use the ideas that derive 
from new people thinking about things yeah. in other ways. Yeah, and regen's a really good name in a way because it you know does what it says on the tin, regenerate. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a way, it's the practice which connects all these terms together and will address our planetary crisis. So one of the things in talking to you just now that I never thought about, because usually with the phrase regenerative farming, um, and this might just be my uh, lack of intelligence in some way or inability to conceptualize something, but it almost seemed like it was like you took something dead and then you regenerated it. But actually what you're talking about is a continuous cycle of making it happen. So it's not something you just do once or twice to kickstart but it's constantly thinking. You've been thinking about it since 1973. Yeah, we've had a relationship with this landscape since 1973, so time enough to see the impact of one's practices and mm. one's mistakes uh, on the outcomes in terms of soil and biodiversity and Not everything. mistakes, learning opportunities. Exactly. <laughs> we're, we're here in the cow building, and I suppose, to my earlier point, if the farm is an ecosystem, um, all the parts of it are connected. The, the bit between the food and the land and the cheese that we produce is the cows. So they are the connectors. And the cows here are all, nearly all, descended from 30 animals that we bought in 1973, 22 from Scotland and eight from Sussex. And the key is that they're loved. Uh, that was a deviation from what I really wanted to say. <laughs> but you've got, to, you've got to say that there's an atmosphere. When you come in here, the cows are as quiet and as loving as they've ever been. And when we go in the collection yard, they don't move away from us, they move towards us. That's a really good sign if you listen to Temple Grandin. Um, but the breeding of these cows, over time, the maternal lines have become adapted to the place. Whereas, like so many other farmers, we're using AI, so we brought in uh, semen from air sugars all over the world probably and some of them had a bit too much Holstein freeze in them for my liking and then various people have experimented shall we say with Normand, uh, with uh, beetles and here are a couple of um, examples up there with grassy tail and bumble snout that are uh, beef crosses with air sugars that definitely look after themselves uh, before they put milk in the tank but we love that well, so actually just in thinking of the ecosystem thing, and then ecosystems are quite, I don't know, in my estimation, like the herd is its own little system. And so I feel like grassy tail and this is humble now, and also, you know, Lulu. My feeling is they bring something to that collective as well. So while they might not be top mill producers, but they definitely have their quality. Yes, and also these are the breeds that come in the normal bond the Welsh Black, the Hereford, they all have their own temperament mm. and then there's some sort of alchemy that goes on because all these cows are related to the soil of this place and over time I think once one's bringing, bringing in outside influences and we've probably done a bit too much of that, nevertheless there's a positive version of this as well. Basically what you're saying is you've inserted some diversity and then you maintain diversity out there as well, so isn't there a sort of logic to I think there is. I, I think there's the diversity of the animals on the farm shouldn't be some sort of homogenized dairy super bowl with semen from, you know, God knows how many uh, high performing cows. And I think ideally should be adapted to the farm itself, mm -hmm. which would be diversity, because it would be the ecosystem diversity of this place. So we've compromised there, but also in many other areas as well. And as you say, there's also the nature of this place, which is also unique. Mm. But I think that if one understands this, this interconnecting ecosystems, and in a way, the stomach of the cow is a biome, a microbiome. Um, the dairy and the straw mm. of the cheese is another one. And then the grass that they're eating in the silage here is another one. So there's all, and you know this idea with milk or with other animal products you are what you eat or eats so there's a lovely connection there. so and i have to say sometimes when i'm out here in the evenings pushing this forward or in the mornings um i always think it's kind of sad that i can't eat that because it smells amazing like i because i don't know if you look at what your dog is eating or whatever you don't eat that 
but no. he has well, funny, funny enough, we had a chap milking many years ago, and he went off and worked on a conventional diary, sorry, conventional dairy, <laughs> and uh, he came back and he said, um, he said, your silage smells different from the silage that I've been working with. It smells sweet. And even the shit, he said, smells sweet. <laughs> and I think that's true. If you farm in harmony with nature, the grass is different, what can coexist with the grass is different. Hey, look after Jen. She's making all she's. And the whole thing is, it's all, the quality of the cheese, in the end, goes right back through the cows, through the breeding of the cows, through the love of the cows, and right back to what they ate. And that's the future of all farming. Well, this might be a rather weird place, you know, a bunch of hippies that came here 48 years ago, that sort of stuff. But actually, the future of farming, I think, is connected to managing pieces of land, treating them as an ecosystem, de deriving as much of the food that is produced from the resources of the land itself, not bought in everything, which has been the, you know, understandably, the way that many farmers are operating, because it's paid better. But I think the future now, because of climate change, because of biodiversity loss, because of COVID, because of everything, we have to farm more like this. The, the direction of the dairy farming will be towards relocalization, including all the stuff that, that we put into the cows, which is should be produced on this hill. And in our case, it mostly is. I mean, we're buying a little bit of organic cake, but basically everything else the cows eat and are bedded on comes from here. So that's super really important thing, is that really, since I've been here and I've been making cheese and working on it, um, and working with Joss, who does the same as me, only uh, for a much longer time, and more knowledge, it occurred to me that with the job of the cheesemaker here, it's not really to make the best archetype of cheddar cheese. It's not for me to have a conception of what cheddar is and to bring that here. It's actually for me to say and to think, ah, we make a cheddar cheese. How can I make the best cheddar from the milk that comes of this land? So it's really working and making sure that we're working with that milk rather than saying, I want milk that does this. Yes, yeah, so that means that every day you have to subtly respond to the changing milk composition. Maybe that affects the timing of the cheese making process. It's like sailing a ship, isn't it? You have to sort of go with these different influences. It's remarkable how similar the two things are in terms of raising, like getting your herd right. And then I always think of the cheese as a sort of microcosm yeah. of that kind of organization. And if you're not patient with them, that's not, you can't force them into something. No. But, I mean, it's the same with the cheese, you can't force it. And there's a sort of, um, there's a circularity about it, but also there's, when you, when things, when you get things right, there's a very good feeling about it, isn't it? And it's sort of, when things are right with the milking, you know, you do rate the mate. <laughs> so we need to do rate the milking, because, you know, if we have a good milking, the cows, no shit, the cows are very, very calm, everything's good, and they've been well fed, then you, as the cheese maker, will pick that up. Because you're doing this lacto-fermentation, which is fascinating, isn't it? Say what you do. Oh, well, so so that we know, because you can't just actually sense what's happening with the milk. But so every day we do a sample of the milk, fresh raw milk, nothing added to it, and then we ferment it for 24 hours at 38 degrees. And then that gives us an idea of what the flavors are in it, like what the viscosity is, how well it's acidifying. And we can talk to you or to Al or to Becky, who's doing milking, or to Ross and myself, and it just gives us that little bit more information on how to treat the milk the next day. And I don't know. I always think the cows can smell it on me. <laughs> so, when you, I know what makes for me, I know what's going to make me feel really good about a cheese maker, a day in the cheese. What's going to make you, like, I know what are my points of wonder are. But what are your points of wonder when you're here with me? Um, it sounds like a dumb question, but I always I think, I um, wonder it. <laughs> well, there's an atmosphere, which when you, it's now actually, I mean, look at these, these um, in-car peppers. 
they just look good. You know, they look as if they're, well, they look well. Some would say a little bit too well. But I don't think they would. And you can see there's some Norman crosses here. So that's very interesting. They're all going to carve in the summer, mostly the summer. And, um, but there's just an atmosphere about them that they look as if they are, um, there's a cumulative vitality about the animals and actually this place and interesting back to our earlier conversation your question the the vitality of the farm as a wild place needs to somehow be matched with the vitality of the animals the quality of the cheese which you're as it were extracting from the the land is like the fat of the land mm. and the surplus and the two are linked so if you're producing very good vital food and the ecosystem is flourishing you know there are toads and there are frogs and newts in the ponds and the water runs clear and the soil is building that's what makes it feel good let's go over and have a brief look at the cheese dairy so hello everybody um becky here i've taken over from patrick and i've still got jen with me which is wonderful and we're going to talk a bit more about the cheese and here we are looking into the um make room uh, very quiet at the moment, uh, cheese making tomorrow, Jen will be cheese making tomorrow. Um, and if I just pan round, we can see the vat, which is a round vat um, and holds, yeah, we about 1500 litres of milk. So two days milk we can make cheese. Um, and I suppose, Jen, I'd quite like to talk to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, about you know you you love eating Havel cheese so you also make Havel cheese really well now uh, and you have a really strong connection to with the place and with the, the cows and with the this landscape which is all more recent um, and how do you feel as a cheesemaker about working with the milk that you understand so intimately now because of the relationship you have with the herd and with the land so what I would say is before I got here I had a conception of what raw milk was I've done loads of experiments and different things with different people's milk all of which I totally appreciated but I think I never really understood how strong the connection was between the overall sort of well-being of the herd and then the milk that comes through into the parlor and I, I chose the word well-being because it's not about their health or their productivity that kind of thing it's really about when they're feeling good about themselves and you know when you're in the milking parlor and they seem as Patrick said like really relaxed and calm then that I, and maybe I'm projecting, maybe I'm calm with that milk at that point because I'm like, oh yeah, this was really nice milk. Um, regardless, I'm part of that system too now, so it works. I think um, what's really interesting, and it's, it's, we're very lucky uh, being the team that we are and being this small actually and everybody mucking in as they do, um, is that you and Joss um, are cheesemakers make great cheese but also milk cows beautifully understand who's in the herd um, know them all so well know who's about to carve uh, you, you know you're on a journey with them as well as with the milk and I, I think that that sensitivity and that understanding and that relationship that interaction is so um, precious uh, to us and to the farm and to this land. Well I have to say it's really precious to me to have that opportunity to make the cheese that way um, in a large part because I mean I want to make cheese that's really good for Holden Farm dairy but also like I I don't want to let the cows down like they've they provide their they provide so much for the landscape around me for the farm they like they make me really happy they produce this amazing milk and I just feel like oh I don't want to make a product that doesn't do service to the quality that they're giving me yeah and I'm not sure I would have felt that way before shall we go and see um, a few of the cows that are about to carve actually oh I definitely yeah, don't so. <laughs> yeah so this is Mrs. Teapot she's a really uh, so this, she's uh, she's born in 2008 
So this is going to be, she's due to come up in about a week, and this will be her 11th car. Um, and she's a real character. She's very, very uh, her own her individual being. Mm -hmm. She's got a real sense of herself. And she's an absolutely wonderful character. So she's, we don't have any problems with her. She's just an incredibly nice member of the community. <laughs> so if we're, that we're, she's due, she's served to an Ayrshire. Um, uh, a nice traditional Ayrshire, because that's not so easy to find in terms of um, semen coming in, being brought in anymore. Um, and we're um, really hoping, which is unusual in the day, that she has a bull calf. <laughs> because uh, I think it's our last chance to potentially uh, rear our own bull from Mrs. Teapot, who I think would give us a great um, next you know, to help us work forward with our um, So what is it about Mrs. Teapot that makes her special? I, I think it's a lot to do with her, well, obviously with her longevity, you know, she's about yep. to have her 11th. Mm -hmm. We haven't had any problems with any of her carvings. She's, she, she gives the right amount of milk for her. She's a white smoke, which is not quite small, so again, just trying to keep that traditional um, size. She's not a perfect looking cow, but She's, um, she's, I love her character, she's a great member of the, the community. Um, and I suppose thinking about the cows, uh, and the fact that, as Patrick was talking about earlier, you know, it's, it's always heard, um, you know, it's generations of mothers and daughters adapting to this landscape, to this farming system. Um, so for an old, older member of the team, like Mrs. Teapot, to give us potentially our next generation of breeding feels right because she's so well adapted to this girl. So this is the storerooms in Havant. These are the youngest cheeses. That one was made two days ago, the one up top there. And you can see they are naturally rinded. So they are in here drying out. We have cloths underneath so they don't stick too much uh, to the wood. And that also we don't put cloths on the top so they can breathe properly. Here you see I've just been organizing a bit of a probe to do some moisture reading on that so that we can make sure we're getting our moistures right. And then again, this goes back to from those youngest cheeses that were in the beginning here, then this is where the age starts to even out again. So these ones up at the top are the end of March. And then you can see them aging along that wall. And then these are the next batch along, the sort of next stand of them. These are from the beginning of March, you know, the middle tenth. So you can see how they change, really. And then this is, again, the next stage. Um, what we do is we, um, so that's the 18th of February. That gives you a, a pretty good idea, actually. We rub them and turn them. We turn them twice a week to start with, and then we do a few just uh, once a week, I think like a month or so, and then after that uh, we do every two weeks and then two every month. And really rubbing them down, giving them a nice coat, and letting them rest on their own so that they can not be too bothered, um, but nicely looked after. We keep them in the, you know, they're batch groups. We try and keep them relatively close so that they have their space, but they also have a sense of togetherness. Um, to be honest, I often think of the batches of cheese a little bit like the batches of calves in the herd. You know, they're all part of one big system, but they do like to be with one another. <laughs> 